Genesis chapter 12. But as you're uh, as you're turning, I'm sure all of us have that one person whenever we gather together for holidays or special events or even maybe uh, for what today is, if it's not Wild Churches, right, for Super Bowl, where you have that one family member who loves to tell stories. The reason why I call them stories is because you know that there's large portions of the event that didn't happen. Um, I had an uncle that was very talented at these stories. Uh, one particular one that he was telling us that one, one holiday is about a, a sequence of events that he said happened uh, while he was in war. Now, something sidebar, I have to tell you that this particular uncle never served in the military. I can tell you about something about this uncle, but that's all right. The story serves a purpose anyway. See, the story is about two pilots. Now, this co-pilot is, is something in particular that I have to tell you. See, he was one of the kind of guys that, uh, that he got passed for a football team. He tried and tried and tried and never made it. Decided to go into the military without being drafted. And he tried and tried and tried and he kept getting rejected from flight school. He finally made it, but he got turned down from mission after mission after mission. Maybe you've been through a, situ a similar situation like this. But in every single instance, in every single situation, this guy, he would always say that he was right where God wants him to be. That he didn't harbor any ill will. That he knew that there was a reason, there was a purpose for him to be turned down or to be passed over for certain situations. And that was where he needed to be. But see, he ended up getting deployed because... A pilot was killed. So that co-pilot was elevated to a pilot. He was put with that brand new pilot as a co-pilot, and they were deployed. They're flying a flight mission, a night mission, and, and as I said, there are certain parts of these, these stories that that, um, that have truthful facts. And this part is true because I had to look it up and make sure. But um, they had a night mission, and they're flying. Very low visibility because of fog, and they're flying over water, but they ended up getting shot down, long story short. When they hit the water, the plane pretty much disintegrated. They, they grabbed some floatsome, whatever they could find, and they're trying to gather their, their mind, trying to gather everything they're rich about them so they can flag down somebody to rescue them. In the process of going down and crashing into the water, the pilot has suffered third degree burns in his eyes and can no longer see anything. Now he's completely dependent on the co pilot, who had previously said he was right where he needed to be. See, this block of scripture today, it's, a, it's an excellent block of scripture um, for many different topics. One of the most popular ones is about obedient faith. And there's nothing wrong with preaching a sermon about obedient faith out of this block of scripture right here. But sometimes we all need to know that we need to be broken to be used by God. See, a little bit further on in this story, see this co-pilot, he's floating in the water with the pilot, and he's trying to fl fly down a plane that keeps flying over them in the, as they're floating in the water. Now, these planes have done two flybys already, and the pilot, just out of frustration, he screams at the co-pilot, and he says, how did you use the flare? He says, of course, I have it in my hand. He said, well, have you broke it yet? You have to break it to use it. Well, then he breaks it. He waves it in the air. Shortly after that, they were rescued. See, in our block of scripture right here, Abraham, as many of you are familiar is told to leave his father's land, to leave his father's house, and to go to a land that he did not know, to paraphrase the book of Hebrew. So if you turn with me to Genesis chapter 12, it begins, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, and to a land that I will show thee. One of the first things that we have to see, and the first thing I want to say this morning, is we have to be removed from situations. We have to be removed around certain people that 
would hinder us from being used from God. Now, Abraham was surrounded by sinful people. Isaiah chapter 59, verse 2, it reads, But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you that he will not hear. So Abraham lived among the, the tall deans. Uh, one of our classes in, in, uh, in the Fuller School of Preaching is Old Testament history. We've got some very talented preachers and teachers there, and, and they were telling us that and showing us how the Chaldeans would erect these 20 to sometimes 30 foot altars. These idols that they would worship, they would store specially designed cabinets in their homes for little trinkets and altars that they could carry around with them throughout the day. Little portable idols that they would hold with them, stored by their bed in their home. These are the kind of people that God wanted Abraham separated from. See, before heading to Canaan, Abraham lived in Ur, and this is the kind of land that his father, Terah, brought the whole household up in. These people were corrupt and immoral in every way. See, uh, it wasn't just the people around him. Abraham's family was corrupt. Terah, the father of Abraham, raised him in a house that condoned polytheism. It condoned multiple gods and multiple purses, um, purposes, like a god, god for every reason and god for every season. See, the corruption did not stop with the father, though. See, Abraham's whole family was corrupt. Later on, you see in Abraham's life, after he was married and after he had settled and after, you know, they had moved, he had his own children. He go and, uh, and allow for one of his servants to go seek a wife for his son. In Genesis chapter 24, verse 2 through 6, Genesis 24, verse 2 through 6, it reads, And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house, and rule over all that he had, put, I pray thee, thy hand under thy thigh. And I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son, the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell. He knew well enough that the people around him were idolatrous. They were not God-fearing people. But see, that's only part of it. Starting verse 4. But thou shalt go unto my country, to my kindred, and take a wife unto my son Isaac. And the servant said unto him, For the of the woman will not be willing to follow me unto this land, must I need to bring thy son again into the land from whence we came? And Abraham said unto him, Beware that thou bring not my son thither again. So not only did he live in a sinful world, he knew not to expose his son to a simple environment. So not only was Abraham surrounded by simple people, if we can correlate this to us today, if we can parallel this, we are surrounded by simple people. We live in a land where sin is condoned, and we can look no further than, than signs going down the road sometimes. I've seen signs that condone divorce. Ten dollar divorce special, I saw. Ten dollar. And that's where our society, that's where we think, that's our frame of mind as a society now. That abortion is no longer a risky term. That pornography and, and risky things like that are, are customary things in the world. It's weirder if you don't than if you do. And that's the world that we live in now, surrounded by sin. See, God wants us removed from these sinful people just as much as he did for Abraham. And we see this in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17, where it reads, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. See, today we must do two things. We must not embrace the practices of the world. As 1 Corinthians 15, 33, it says, Be not deceived, evil communication corrupts good manners. I remember, uh, you know, I had a, a country upbringing, so I remember, um, Grandmother that used to say a whole bunch of little slick country sounds. 
things. But um, but you can round them all down to the basic thing that if, if you hang around with people long enough, you're going to, just by osmosis, just by being by them, you're going to inherit some of their traits. Some of that is just going to come off on you. If you're around somebody that parties all the time, well, guess what, man? Eventually, you're going to go to one of them parties too. If you're around somebody who uses profane language all the time, even if you are adherent to it, eventually, something's going to slip out. Because everything you do, positive or negative, plants seeds in your mind. Everything you do, positive or negative, plants seeds in your heart, and those plants, they bear fruit. Good or bad. Next thing that we must not do is allow the world to infiltrate our homes. Now, this is on the fathers and the mothers. And John chapter 3, verse 20 says, For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, and neither cometh to the light, lest the deeds should be reproved. We well, see, we live in a land where our families are influenced, strongly influenced. And I, I know this more today than I ever have before because. I have an eight-year-old and four-year-old that know more about smartphones than I ever will. I mean, ever will. I use her to reboot my phone and my computer sometimes. <laughs> but the influence is there. You have to guard it so sacredly because just as I said before, that you're, the people that you keep around you, they'll plant seeds in your mind. That influence you, the ones that influence you the most bear the fruit in your life. And then you're going to see this in your children as they start to bear fruit. You're going to see what is the most important influence on their life based on their actions and based on how they talk and act around other people. See, God wants to be the influence in our home, nothing else. Scripture says that God is a jealous God, and that is the absolute truth. He will not tolerate anything in between you and Him. Today, we must not allow these God, um, these idols, to be stowed away in our homes, as as Terah, the, the father of Abraham, had allowed. See, we have not <clears throat> not have any other influence except for God. But see, listen to this prayer right here. And I, I really, I had to read this over and over and over. And if you have a heart for Jesus, if you know, um, and I'm not talking about the movie, if you really know the passion of the Christ, if you really know what he went through, if you really know what he was sacrificing by reading this gospel, return to the gospel of John with me in chapter 17. Chapter 17. And listen to the words of this prayer. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also might glorify thee. And thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is eternal, life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. He wasn't praying for escape. He wasn't praying for the pain to go away. He wasn't praying for less stripes on his back. He wasn't praying to, be, uh, to not be crucified. He wasn't praying for our sins not to be placed on his back. He was praying that God's will be done. That is the influence that God wants on our families and on our homes, and not what the world wants to influence on our homes. The second thing I need to show you tonight is that not only do we need to be evil, removed from our sinful situations that we need to be rebuilt. And I, at the very beginning of the lesson, I said, I did, you know, the funny little phrase, you've got to be broken and used. And he's talking about flair, but our lives are the same way. We build up walls around ourselves, and inside those walls we have these little comfort zones that we express our spirituality within that comfort zone. Well, 
I'm going to tell you, by personal experience, I, I can tell you in my own life that you cannot be used by God with those balls up. I just really want that to settle in because a broken vessel, a broken vessel can be used more by God than a vessel that's dedicated to something else. Abraham had to be rebuilt from his prior life. God separated him from everything he knew. And God was going to do something great through him. Now the greatness God would bring forth through Abraham was contingent on one thing. One thing. Abraham relying on God alone. Not his own talents. Not his own abilities. Not his own wisdom. Not his status. Not his family. Not his land. Not his possessions. On God alone. In Jeremiah chapter 33 verse 3 it says, Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. To paraphrase the scripture in another place, it says, you know, my, my, my thoughts are, are, are higher than yours. You, you can't comprehend what my mind is or what my intention is for your life. Some of the truest, some of the most faithful believers that we see in the Bible are those who were willing to follow along when they did not know God's intention for their life, but they knew God well enough to know that God's intention for their life will be good. We also must be rebuilt from our prior life. We can correlate this. We can also parallel this as, as long as we move ourselves, we can also rebuild ourselves. God wants us to be separated from everything we knew as well. Don't dwell on it, but think about it. Before you were baptized, there were things, there were parts of your life that were or should have been, should be now, different from your life now. They're not present now. Everything that was your old self, that's why Scripture says that your new body, a new self is born. A new man in Christ or woman. God's desire is for us to be molded according to his need and purpose. And we see this perfectly in Isaiah chapter 43. If you want to turn to Isaiah chapter 43, verse 1. Isaiah 43. Shall all families of the earth be blessed. 
by God's hand, many others will be blessed by Abraham. Think about that. Not just himself, not just immediately his wife, not just his children, but think about who he brought with him. Think about his cousin, his lot. Think about his grandchildren that would precede him, that, that would come after him. Our decisions affect and make waves, the ripple effect throughout this life. And we are refreshed also. We, we have this opportunity also to be refreshed by the blessings of God. By God's hand, we will be blessed. But do we realize how far we were from God? Now, before we were baptized, and I heard this water running as, as I was coming in here, and, and it's one of my favorite sounds. And, and I know it, and it might sound silly, but it's, it really is. Because you realize how far we are from God before we went in there. What may seem like such a simple act to the world, but to those of us who understand the meaning of that, the representation of that, the literal trend, the, the literal um, change that takes place after, during that and after that. Romans 3.23, it's a familiar verse, but for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And when we come to realize that, when it starts to grieve our spirit, when it starts to really hurt our heart and pushes us towards that change and, and, and drives us here. See, by God's hands, we will be blessed, but God, by God's hands, others could be blessed as well. 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, it reads, Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. And that's all it takes, is that, to rely on God alone, to understand and magnify who God truly is. Do we realize how we affect other people? And to raise one, something that I have underlined here, and, and for a reason, is that my prior life, or uh, as me and, and a brother of Christ, we call it pre-Christ, we call it pre-Christ, I, I come to realize now how a profound impact I've had on people's lives pre-Christ in such a negative way. Negative way. By actions that I committed in seconds or minutes or hours maybe, takes years to recompense or to build bridges or or to repair uh, broken feelings or hearts. In the same way that we can affect people in a negative way, by living in Christ, according to God's will, we can affect people in much more profound ways. See, now by God's hand, we can affect other lives by how God has intended. In John chapter 15, verse 16, uh, verse 16 to 18, it reads, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that, who, that whatsoever ye shall do, ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he shall give it to you. These things I command you, that ye love one another. If the world hates you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. This co-pilot that I brought up at the beginning of the lesson. See, he was one of these guys that no matter what he tried to do the first time around, he just never got it done. But if you remember, at the beginning of the lesson, what did he say after every failure, after every past opportunity, or, or what he said, uh, shortcoming, he was right where God needed him to be. Have you ever counted yourself broken? Have you ever felt like your scenario or the people around or maybe even yourself? Have you ever beaten yourself up to the point where you feel like you can't take it anymore? You're broken. You've had enough. You're ready to throw in the flag or throw in a towel or whatever the saying is. Put your hands and say, that's just enough. The Bible has shown us some critical information today that it's, it's not about what you can take, but it's about what Christ can take. And Christ can take all of your burden. All of it. But you have to be broken. There can't be anything left in the 
the tank for you and what you want and what you think you can do. And once you give up on that, God can do so much through you. Let's remember the illustration at the beginning of this lesson. See, the, the pilot, the pilot was completely dependent upon the co-pilot for his salvation. See, we're lucky. We don't, we don't, we don't have to be dependent on anybody else for our salvation. We don't. Christ has already made it possible for us to be saved, and only requires our brokenness. Then and only then, when we are broken and we stop relying on ourselves, can we be used by God and we'll be right where we need to be. So, if you have anything laying in between you and God today, don't let it hinder you anymore. Don't don't let it stop you from approaching God. Don't let it stop your prayer life, your worship life, your singing. Don't let it stop how you interact with brothers and sisters in Christ. Don't let it stop you from attending worship service. Don't let it hinder you anymore. If you've been baptized, lay it down. But if you haven't, brothers and sisters, this is the opportune time. Come forward. Me and Jack and some other brothers will pray with you. I'll study with you. Jack will study with you. But this is the time. If you know you're broken, let God use you. As we sing, come forward.